Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Goodman with Art Matcher, the mobile app which will bring innovation to the art industry and is coming to you soon. While we work hard to build and release this app, we'll be talking art with some of the industry's most interesting and knowledgeable people. Whether you're an art aficionado or this is all new to you, we'll be here to provide valuable insight and hilarious good stories. Hope you enjoy our chat today. My name is Michael Goodman. Welcome to Art Match for the podcast. I'm in the studio today with Bergen. Bergen, we met pre-pandemic, <laughs> so I'm still learning about you. Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me, Michael. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm from, uh, I mean, I always say I'm from Chicago, but I was actually born in Texas. I lived there till I was like 10 um, in San Antonio. Fuck with San Antonio. Um, and then I moved to Chicago, actually Evanston, which is like on the far north side. It's like the first suburb out. And I lived there, you know, till I was like 18, till I went to college. And I so think- So wait, you were in Texas from- Ages one to 18? Yeah, from no, from zero to 10. Okay, zero to 10. Yeah, and then I got to, to Evanston in, uh, or Chicago, whatever you want to say. Chicago motherfuckers will never let an Evanston person say they're from Chicago. And an, Evan, <laughs> an Evanston person always says they're from Chicago. Um, but yeah, so I got there when I was in fifth grade. I remember, uh, yeah, starting elementary school. It was like the first public school I went to. And I had, um, yeah, I had like these shoes on because I was in private school before that. And it was just like, I actually think my mom had given me those shoes. Like they were her shoes. And she was like, here you go. You can wear these to school. Like they're like some kids, you know, like, you know, unisex shoes. They weren't like high heels. I was going to say, were you cross dressing? No, no, no. But, <laughs> you know, but like it was definitely not a, a, a smooth move, you know. And some kid at like the first day of school was like, dude, where'd you get those shoes from? Your mom? And I was like, yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, bro. Wow. Mind reader. <laughs> yeah. And then he proceeded to just like pummel me. Wow. <laughs> So was living in, in, in Chicago, well, is, should I say Chicago or Chicago fans are going to be like, no, that's not Chicago. It's interesting. You know, like Evanston, it's still on like, you know, like the Chicago's got the L, which is like the train, you know, and Evanston's like the last stop on the North side, you know, so it's on the L. So it's Chicago. So we'll call it Chicago for this interview. Cause for me, it's like interesting every time my perception, when I think about people from Chicago, mm -hmm. I feel like they have a rough exterior, a little bit rougher than actually people from New York, mm -hmm. because, you know, the media, what, what's been portrayed about Chicago, you hear Chicago like, and I know there's probably like, this is just me not knowing, but I'm sure there's like great, terrific places in Chicago, but like, it's amazing how on a subconscious level, I don't know why it comes to me like, oh man, Chicago's rough. <laughs> so where you're from in Chicago can you kind of describe like what was that environment like and in relationship to that, how it brought you into the creative space that you are now in visual art? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Actually, that's a really good question. Um, so Evans and I would say is like a little mini microcosm of, of Chicago, you know, like we have a North side, a South side and uh, a West side. We don't really have an East side cause we're on the lake, you know, just like, just like Chicago. Um, and so it's very diverse. There's only one high school. There's one public high school. So everybody from the richest of the rich to the poorest of the poor, if you go to public school, is in the same high school. Um, so you get to learn how to deal with each group of people, you know, like you got to be able to to go into someone's house and like eat properly at their dinner table. But you also got to make sure that you can't say some fucked up shit and get your ass whooped at school. You know, like it's like wow. two, two sides of the same thing. You got to learn everything. And so I think that's the important part about Evanston is it's such a, you, it's so diverse, you know, it's really diverse and you got, you know, a large black population, a large white population and a lot of everything in between, you know, a lot of Arab and Hispanic and Jewish and it's, it's all in there. And so you got to learn everything. Um, and then I think how it influenced my art is that it's got such a deep uh, roots in graffiti. You know, like Evanston's got a lot of really heavy graffiti writers. When I was growing up, there was this guy named King Kaiser. And in Chicago, like graffiti, he was like a champion. He was like all city. Like, wow. Yeah, he he died like doing graffiti. He got hit by a train. And there's no. like, yeah, there's like a lot of controversy around that, whether he was like pushed or whatever. Um, but he was one of these guys that was just a legend. And he went into my high school. So like... 
on the every window in my high school is scribed with a Kaiser. You know, how old was he when? Shoot, man, he must have been like I don't know how old he was when he died. I don't, I'll get fact checked really quickly if I say some fucked up shit. But um, no worries. I mean, like, I mean, how old were you when you were inspired by? I mean, I moved to Evanston when I was. 10 so i mean like 11 12 oh wow so you were that early on in in the game if you yeah if you were doing graffiti like you just you knew who he was he was that guy you know like he had pieces up that you know every other graffiti artist would just go around so there's like year you know like and you got to be a badass for that shit to happen because everybody's yeah crossing out everybody yeah you know you got to have some fucking credentials so when i was growing up Graffiti is really what inspires my art. It inspires um, a lot of what I do. It's if you look at my paintings, they all have a lot of like hard lines. I use a lot of super saturated colors. Um, when I was in art school, there was always this big faux pas about using like black in a painting. You know, they're always like you can get close to a black, but yeah, but not that. using black. And that that's a fine art kind of learning. I think it's interesting that you brought that up because I have a background in painting mm-hmm. and kind of the way my professor taught me about it, it wasn't like black was like this thing you don't use. It was like, use it very carefully because it's going to use kind of like, it's going to, it's going to do an impact Mm -hmm. on it. So I learned how to use really dark Browns when mixing my colors. Yeah, for sure. Um, But it's interesting because when I think about street art, a lot of the cats that I know and talk to, They don't have that formal training. So what came first for you? The formal training or were you hitting the street? Like, when did that start? Did you start at 10 years old going around being a hoodlum? The (laughs) ones who tag my gallery all the time? Yeah, yeah. Bitching about those wheat paces outside. That was me. No. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think I've always just been in general a hoodlum, whether it was through art or not. I think... uh, yeah, my mom's always like, you were born with devil horns on your head, you know, and everybody can always see them. So just creating chaos. Yeah. I don't know why that happened to me. Maybe it's something about being the youngest, but not of how many of four. So I have two older brothers and an older sister. Very cool. And, and are, are any of them in the arts as well? No, man. They're one of them's a philosopher. So he's unemployed. (laughs) <laughs> and my sister, she's he's a, an artist. Yeah, yeah. No, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> my sister's a robotic engineer and my brother's a doctor. Oh, wow. Okay. So you got some, there's, there's ones that have some structure. Oh, they're making money. They're, that's why I'm here today, baby. Thank you guys. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Sophie. Hey, shout out. <laughs> I love it. It's interesting because being in the art space, I find it's tough to keep the motivation going because as an artist, you're your own boss, you know, no one's going to tell you to create. Yeah, totally. And then the incentive to create, you know, it's hard. And like most businesses, the incentive is you're getting paid for your time, Mm -hmm. but with art, you're choosing your time to be art in a way. So what keeps, I want to ask this, what made you make the move to LA? Yeah, so I was living in San Antonio until like June or May, maybe. And um, maybe March, actually. Shit, it's kind of been, it's been a long ass time. Um, Pandemic has just been flying through. I know, man. It's been a blast. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I was working, you know, and, and for the last shit, for how long I've been applying to galleries and getting shows and, and, and doing, you know, work but you find yourself working it's like a in texas and san antonio the art scene was so much smaller you know there's not so many um places to reach towards there's maybe two or three galleries that if you can get into like that's the move and you could be set you know like they really like to replay people there you know and I had a lot of hard time actually getting into the gallery. In fact, like the first time I got into the gallery, I had already left. You know, I just did a show at Blue Star. They did like a red dot sale and I had a piece up there. And so I found myself questioning, why am I working so hard towards something that I was using as a, as a, as a, a footstep anyway? You know, like I was saying, if I could make it in Texas, then I'll know I can make it, you know, fill in high profile art city, you know? whether it's New York or London or LA or Mexico city or some shit like that, you know, but 
I found myself putting so much effort into doing that, that it seemed ridiculous to put that much effort into something that was just a sample of what I was going to do in the end. You know, like I always wanted to be in New York or LA. Any artist wants to be in a place where the art they make is being bought at the price they want to be bought at. Do you, bro? I am so sorry, guys. I actually didn't put my phone on silent. No, no, and I've been doing this a while. Embarrassing, embarrassing. Embarrassing, but it, it, don't worry. We're not going to cut it out. Yeah. You guys are first. Go ahead. That was an embarrassing ringtone. <laughs> no, but every artist, you know, like what I was saying, is that every artist wants to live in a place where their art is being bought at the the price they feel represents the what they put into it. And to get some recognition too, you know, like. How do you assess that value though? Because for me as a gallerist, I know what I need to do when I see an artist, but for yourself internally, Ooh, it's what's like, your process like? It's kind of like a faux pas to talk about prices for art, you know? So this is like an interesting conversation. I don't know. Uh, every bone in my body is telling me not to talk. So maybe it's an important thing to talk about. I actually base it off of like my cost of living, you know? Like, I mean, my rent is you know, insert rent amount. Um, and that has to get paid every month. It has to get paid, you know? Yeah. And if you're going to ask me to make a piece of art for you, or if you're going to buy a piece of my art, then I need you to know that, you know, a, that rent needs to be paid. Bills need to be paid. You know, I don't live a fancy lifestyle. You know, this is just COVID days. You know, I eat, I sleep, I drink, I fuck and I make art, you know, it doesn't cost a lot to do that shit, but I need you to know that if you're, Mm, buying my art that you're supporting your lifestyle yeah you know like because i actually learned this from you you said this you were like when you buy someone's art you're buying their life you know it took their entire life up until that point to make the piece of art that you're buying and i think just a little bit of appreciation and maybe if you could pay for that life to continue then that's exactly what i need so my art isn't based off of you know like the art world's prices it's based off of I mean, needing to live, you know, when you buy, well, I think what happens is as you start, like in any business, there's a supply and demand, um, kind of aspect to something, meaning you're one person you're creating, yeah. you know, you can only create X amount of works in a year. Mm-hmm. Let's say you create one masterwork a month mm-hmm. and that that's, that's actually a tall bill to order. You when I push talk yourself. about masterwork, meaning something you're so proud of, you couldn't do it any other way. Each than one that gets way. better. Yeah. Each one gets better. Yeah. But if you're producing 12 a year, that's it. There's only 12. Yep. And I tell people numbers. If you're selling each piece at $5,000, that's 60,000 a year. That's it. That's the math. That's not, I mean, yeah, they say that. Like, isn't that an interesting, and, and I always ask artists, cause for me, it's like, as a gallerist, when I, if, when I pick up an artist, I got to see where they're starting from. Mm-hmm. Their starting point for me. Man, I'm chipping over the numbers. I don't think I've ever done those numbers before. You just blew my mind. <laughs> no, but you know, that, that's what I'm here for is to do the numbers. What art matcher. What you we're you just to... humbled my ass really fucking quickly right there. I'm like, I got to charge more fucking, <laughs> well, fucking pieces. All right, let's go. I mean, if it was 10,000, it would be 120,000. Even and, then though, shit. And on, it's man. tough to live on that yeah. salary. And motherfuckers get real Especially snotty when you start putting 10,000 on a, on, a, on a painting. They start acting like you're a bougie motherfucker, but it's like, come on, bro. Like I'm just getting by. I'm just getting by, you know? Look, what Art Matcher is trying to do is we're trying to build these relationships between collector, gallery, and artist. Mm-hmm. We all have a place in this world and we yeah. all have like a job we could be doing. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting because what we're trying to do is we're trying to restore where artists can just focus on art. And I think you could attest to attest to this in today's era and, and you know, prior to this, you've had to wear multiple hats in this industry. Oh, come on now. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, and I, I have immense respect that you can just come in, do it, take initiative because- that yeah. takes a certain um, type of skill and ability just as a person. You know, if you're very, if you're very introverted, mm-hmm. I mean, we met through a buddy of ours. Yeah. And he, I would say he's very much an extrovert. 
He can he's, bring people together. That's he for brings sure. people together. He's yeah. a really good talker, really good schmoozer. Shout out to Scott. We didn't forget about you. Don't worry. Just um, with your sexy ass. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's interesting because do you find yourself uh, having a lot of artist peers, like friends? I mean, shit, dude, that's why it's a, a, a lot of the reason why I moved out here, you know, is that in Texas, I mean, I was still working to like I was working a full time job while painting. So I was a bartender and none of my friends were, were artists. I mean, I would say even right now. Shit, dude, <laughs> none of my friends are artists. No, like they're all uh, are mostly I mean, they're all like grinders, you know, like there's a dude that's fucking bartending there's a guy that's uh making his own barbecue company there's a dude that works for like boeing my other roommate works for a shipping company out in long beach uh, my other roommate's a music producer um you know like my best friends like you know work at a hotel they uh so they're working towards their dreams yeah, you know, I think I got a healthy combination of people in my life that are chasing a dream and another group that understand that they're just people that want to be comfortable. You know, like I see this a lot and there really is a clear delineation of people that have chosen that no matter what society's norms say, they have something in their mind and they want to chase it, you know, and that dream could be something like I want to be a fucking uh voiceover for an anime series you know that could be a motherfucker's dream and they're chasing that shit and and the other motherfucker is like i am working towards making a shitload of money so when i'm 40 years old i can not have a job and my dream is to just sit around and drink beer and watch my kids grow old and talk shit and play golf and and do nothing you know and and i have a very even side of both of those people in my life. And it really, because I'm such a, I mean, I gave up everything to do this, you know, like I don't have a safety net. I have a family that would probably not like me to refer to them as a safety net. So I have a family. And they're but always, I mean, I think that's part of uh, what family's for in a way. I mean, we don't, for sure, for sure. we don't try and abuse that aspect. Like, Hey, my brother's a doctor. My mochi, brother, funny enough, is mochi, a doctor. Mochi. <laughs> my, my brother is a doctor too. And it's interesting because I've helped him throughout the career. And oh, I know nice. like when you have an artist or someone in the art field in the family, it's like, Oh, it's like, it's almost like death at a, a funeral. Like, Oh, you chose to do that. Yeah. Like everybody stop talking money. Bergen's coming over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Bergen's going to come for that. But honestly, to tell you the truth, and this is the hardest thing is, you know, I think one of the first things we talked about is like how Chicago is got such a rough exterior, you know, like I, I always think that, there's these shirts in New York you buy that say like, I love New York. Yeah. If you go to Chicago, we have a bunch of shirts that just say Chicago hates you. And I think that's like the appropriate way to understand it. You know, wow. like we don't actually hate you, but you got to be able to take that joke well for us to get to know each other. You know, like if you can handle that and laugh, then it's like, okay, now we get, we can go to the next point now. Now we can actually start talking. You know, would you say your personality is more East coast than West coast? Mm, man, I think it's right there in the middle. I got a lot of like Southern tendencies to me too. You know, like I, I drink iced tea. I make sun tea every morning, you know, and put that shit out in the fucking balcony, let that shit get real hot and bring it right back. Oh my gosh. You're tomorrow. like my manager of my building. They do that every day. I'm the manager of your building, bro. And <laughs> you know, give me that rent, bitch. Uh, <laughs> but no, like I pay it on time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, you there's one of us here. Uh, <laughs> but no, I think that, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think I'm Chicago, which is that, like, I want to be rough and tough. But really, like, if you really talk to Chicago people, we really care a lot, a lot about not just you, but, like, where you come from and stuff like that. Like, if you talk to a Chicago person for long enough, they're going to start asking you questions about your family and shit like that. And I don't think a lot of people that I've seen when I've traveled the world in the United States really want to know that much about your background or really, it's coming from a genuine place. Yeah. They're interested, you know, they're interested because they're, I don't know, man, like Chicago motherfuckers are weird. They probably want to just find like a joke they can make fun of you about, you know, like, Oh, like you're Polish. Like, ah, you got a big ass nose motherfucker. Like, like, <laughs> like, 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 but at the same time, like there's a genuine interest in you that you can't ignore, you know, like Chicago people are rough, but if you can handle their roughness, then we're going to let down our guard and we're going to get real mushy and soft with you. So would you say the influence right now, I mean, in your work, is it more from when you were living in San Antonio or from Chicago? Yeah, it's a good point. Actually, it's both. You know, um, 
I read this Jacob Lawrence quote the other day, and it's like that uh, dude that painted like the Great Migration series and stuff. I actually have a lot of like stuff in common with him that I didn't realize. I'm like re- learning a lot about Jacob Lawrence now, and I'm like, oh shit, dude, I think I'm biting this dude's style. It's terrible. But. Yeah, you always <laughs> learn. I, I find as an artist, you know, so many artists being a gallerist, they'll show me their work and then I'll say, hey, have you seen this guy? They're like, I've never seen this guy in, a, in my life. Oh, I know. It's terrible. And it's, it's crazy because there's subconscious influences where you could have seen something else that wasn't that person that you were influenced. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to do this a little bit better. Yeah. And then you realize that person was actually influenced by someone else. It's, and it's a never ending cycle. We're all stealing from somebody, guys. Get over yourselves. Get over <laughs> your fucking selves, dude. Um, but no, I mean, the worst well, part is that... interpreting. The worst part is that I can't even, like, lie to... I mean, I know who he is, and I've seen his stuff. Like, it was in my, like, history books growing up. Like, when you learn about, like, the civil rights, and you learn about, like, black history in the United States, you learn about the Great Migration. And every time you open up a history book to the Great Migration section, it's a fucking Jacob Lawrence picture right there, dude. It's always a painting, you know? Like, yeah. It's the dudes at, like, the train stop or whatever. But he has this quote anyway, and he says that, you know... I paint what I've experienced. And that's the quote, you know? And that's kind of where I'm at right now is my work is really, I was always a very conceptual person and I don't share my art with a lot of people, but I share it with a few select artists. Uh, One of them, her name's Frances down in San Antonio. Shout out Frances. And she would always push me to do like more introspective stuff about my life, you know? And so the series I've and I was telling you earlier that I'm almost done with this series of, of paintings is all about just my life. It's a, it's a narrative, you know, it's like Jacob Lawrence said, it's just shit I've experienced, you know? And I think a good way to talk about concepts is through experiences, you know? Like if you want to talk to someone about, fuck, dude, I don't know, like uh, minimalism, you know, we can sit here and pull out the textbook and it's going to be a boring ass fucking shit. Or I could tell you an experience that I've had where minimalism was a large theme of that experience, you know, and it's going to be way more interesting. And so the way I built this series that I just finished is like each piece is maybe a snapshot of a narrative of my life. But that snapshot talks about so many different um, conceptual ideas, you know, like I really like conceptual art. I want to talk about deep concepts, but I don't want to fucking bore your ass. I don't want to fucking give you a blank canvas and be like, oh, minimalism. Mm." Well, when we talk what bores people, for me, what I find as a gallerist, it's the lack of understanding. Because when you can understand it and be part of the conversation, chances are you you have something to say about it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, every day, you know, I have the pleasure of seeing the mural you painted outside of the gallery. Oh man, that was a blast. No, thank you. And, and it's, it's interesting because I've had cops drive by (laughs) several times and it's interesting always seeing someone's facial expression. What what, what are they, what do you think their facial expressions are? I'd be interested to hear that. Well, it's interesting. Like, so just about a week ago, I had two cops come up and they said, Hey, can we check your cameras? Obviously, the mural's right outside. I said, what is this for? They said, someone uh, was shooting metal pellets and breaking windows. Uh, I think our neighbor, the Psychic Eye Shop, uh, one of their windows got shattered. Shout out to the Psychic Eye Shop. Yeah, the Psychic Eye. We we love you guys, dude. Unfortunately, they weren't able to predict that ahead of time. But uh, (laughs) that being said... Burn! I'm such a troll sometimes. Roasted. Roasted. That'll be on our next segment. But the (laughs) cop, I could see one of the cops, he was looking at the mural and he wanted to talk about it. And for me, it was like, what do you think this is about? And it was interesting because I think most people's reaction, uh, if you're a cop, it may come from like a negative connotation, meaning like, oh, well, he thinks like this is about us beating people. But the identity of the person being chased, we don't know if that's a good person or not. Mm-hmm. That could be a writer. That could be just someone who, like, just destroyed a business. He it's, could a, have, it's ambiguous. Very yeah, ambiguous. Yeah, he could have been the person shooting the pellets. It could and be then, someone holding a knife that's covered in blood. You know? Yeah, so the reality of it is it's interesting. I've taken no position on that, posi- uh, on that piece in particular. Very, Meaning, like, very wisely done, sir. No, but it's interesting because I've met great cops and I've met, I have a, 
And so what was that cop's, what did he think or she? Well, what I liked about him was he was very much someone who should be a cop, meaning he's like, I need to understand this before I jump to a conclusion of what it's about. And it was interesting seeing him uh, kind of internalizing what I was saying. And I wanted to see if like I could get through to him on that. And he said, huh, that was interesting. He's like, I like it. No. I like, <laughs> hey, damn, dude. You're, it was, good, you're good at your job. <laughs> it was no, it was, it was interesting because And you're like, it caused this much. <laughs> no, I, it's 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 interesting because I think that's what we like when art can do that, you know, when we started mm-hmm. those mural projects, as much as I would love them to be in a lovely home, you know, the the materials where it's done, everything becomes part of the piece. It says street. So, everything about it says street. But know? also, yeah. when I initially put up those boards, it was a form of protection. And it's interesting that you depicted kind of cops or these these images that you know can be perceived as as law enforcement yeah. on these boards that are protecting the business yeah. from potential rioters or people who are looking to cause destruction. Well, and that's a conscious thing, you know. I mean, you got to do research. And when I was, you know, the mural is this, for people who haven't seen it, it's just this sort of, um, it's a perspective flip where everything is coming at you. And there's this sort of riotous situation going on in the background. And the police are sort of charging this silhouette that you can stand into and and, and make a selfie with because the idea was to create a, a piece that someone could interact with. And so you can use this as a backdrop for a photo session where it leaves a silhouette available for you to interact with the the police that are sort of falling down on this piece. And, and yeah, you know, like I, I was, uh, when I was in college for anthropology and race and ethnic studies, I learned that the police were first created as a, I mean, they were a buffer zone between poor people and rich people because poor people can only take so much shit, you know? And they were there to protect people's possessions. And that's exactly what was going on, you know? Like, you're protecting your shit because poor people in this country had enough shit and they were just wilding out a little bit, you know? Like, and, and props. I mean, I mean, some people think we're reaching that point right now with the pandemic, with the disparity. I mean... It's been he- reached, bro. It's been reached. Like, we've been at the point, it's just... How much shit can a motherfucker take, you know? Well, it's interesting, you know, the idea I have. I don't want to say it's a luxury, but I've had in my own circle people who are very well to do. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting hearing their perspective on finance and money. Um. You the know, fact that they have a perspective means that they both have finance and a money because I don't have a perspective on any of this. Well, it's interesting. Some of them are self-made. Some are. Mm-hmm. Some of them, it's uh, maybe generational wealth or maybe things where... Uh, Shit gets passed down, yeah. Uh, and, and, and the reality of it is if you were to have a family right now, I'm, I'm sure you'd want mm-hmm. your potential kid not to have it as rough as you did. You know, you're trying to make their quality of life better. Yeah, for sure. You know, for sure. I I definitely Um, feel that. So it's interesting when it comes to, you know, people who have an immense amount of wealth beyond the preservation of just trying to maintain, you talked about earlier, you you just want your works to support essentially the lifestyle you're living. And some people- I'm not trying to drive like a Bugatti. I just want to keep making art, you know? It's interesting. Someone who, if they grew up in a, a way where that's all they know, that's really all they know. Yeah. And you can't fault someone for like just what, you know, we, I always strive, like, I want to know more, but the reality is there's the things I want to know. And then there's the things I'm just interested in as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and for me, it's, it's interesting. I didn't grow up in, in, let's say a well-to-do family, but no, you, did, I, you did your work. You know. No, what, what, I, what, what I love though, is like the bar wasn't that like high in my book. Yeah. Well, so it's kind of nice to be like, oh yeah, you know, I'm setting, but it, you know, this is, it's all a personal journey and it, it's interesting because, you know, we all, I think in a ter- in a time like this during the pandemic, something to reflect is we all can be doing a lot more. Yeah. No, you know? I mean, because even for you, like 
Think about this. You're able to live in one of the greatest cities right now. You're making it happen, too, because you have a great work ethic. Working every day. Let's go. You know, and like that puts you ahead of so many people who are just born in like, let's say, a caste society in India. Yeah. no, And you're doing better instrumentally, like just. But but I think that, you know, like and and something you just said, you know, it's like um, it's not just you. You like the bar wasn't set that high for you. I was never given a bar, you know, like my I, I told you earlier, like my my siblings are like. They're, they do like pretty, pretty incredible shit. You know, like my brother my, is a philosopher and thinks about like the deepest fucking shit. My other brother's a doctor. My sister's a, you know, robotic engineer. Like, but I was never, ever compared to any of them, you know? And so I never had a bar. And what that did was that you can't, success to me is not built around like a comparison. I don't look at my friends or my roommates or my family and say, I need to be like this to be successful instead, because I mean, like my mom, I, she's a fucking saint, like never, ever expected anything from me ever. You're like, whatever I did, I did. And that was me, you know, like wow. I am Bergen. And so now to me, what that's done to me is forced me to think of success as how do I live a life that makes me the happiest, you know? And that's, you know, if we want to go back all the way to that first question, like why did we jump from San Antonio to LA? It's like, because I knew the way to reach a higher happiness was to do that. You know? Where is your family now, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, it's all over the fucking place, dude. Like, um, my mom's in Vegas and my brother's, uh, so like my oldest brother, Pear, the philosopher dude, he's in Portland. My sister, Sophie, the robotic engineer's in Idaho. And my wow. brother, Ben, is in Palm Desert. Wow, that is really a spread. They're, they're literally all over. Yeah, and it's always been like that. I mean, like, Pear, like, um, he actually lived in... Portland Sweden. seems like a philosophy place, though. Oh, man, this guy's just sitting in his armchair, like, fucking drinking bourbon and then and, and laughing about... He watches Home Alone, like, every night. I don't know what's wrong with him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, he's a fucking nerd. Maybe I'll meet uh, Macaulay Col- uh, Coleman or... What Macaulay Culkin, yeah, yeah. I hope Macaulay not, because Culkin. I think that he was a big cokehead. Uh, <sighs> so, you know, like, Pear, don't get caught up with the wrong crowd, bro. Um, but, like, he was in Sweden for a while, you know? So, like, my family's... it's. I think it's very typical of like a white family. Like everybody just ran away, you know, we were all like trying to get the fuck out of judge. And now that we've grown older, we're trying to get closer back together because we realize how cool we all are. And we're like, oh, wow. Hang on the fuck out. Yeah. Yeah, You know, like, I mean, you want to make something of your life and then you want to realize that everybody's opinion doesn't matter as much. And you should just go hang out and have fun and play board games and, and get trashed. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I come from a big family as well. I'm one of six. Oh so, shit, dude. Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, we're, we're all, uh, I have my sister's actually. It explains a lot, you know, this guy, this guy over here. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting when you're, when, when you're in a big family and I would say even for you, I mean, four is relatively. It's not normal anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's definitely, you know, a lot of people are having less kids. They stop doing that shit. What are your thoughts as, as like, do you think you're, you're anywhere close for like that. Cause I find most people today, you know, millennials are thinking like kind of parenthood comes much later, like oh, mid thirties, yeah. late thirties. No, I can't even, I mean, I'm 30 now and it's like, I find myself Is that even on the horizon. <laughs> dude, I have like significant others that I find myself like feeling that they're stealing my time away, you know, like, I don't know if other artists feel this way, Is that but a like, commitment issue? <laughs> yeah, all right, maybe I got some daddy issues, but like, <laughs> but like, but like, I do, I don't know if other artists feel this way, but like, if you take me away from what I love to do the most, and it's not even like, it's for a bad reason. It's for, you know, like building yeah, a bond and, and, and having intimacy and stuff like that. But there's always this part of me that's like deep down inside being like, this person doesn't want me to be an artist. Yeah, like this person doesn't want me to succeed. Like this person, if you're taking me away from what I love, then you don't want to see me reach my my peak, you know? Yeah, your potential. Yeah. And so I think uh, that's probably just me being fucked up. But yeah, no, but I don't, here, here's which, the- which means I know I don't see a family in the anytime future unless um, that person. And this is very rare. I've heard of it happening. But like if you can find somebody that's about it, you know, like that wants to see you succeed and is also trying their own journey, you know, like. I think that shit could happen, but. Well, I think the the scary part for a lot of people when looking at someone who's in the creative 
feel they they ask like is this person do they have stability and mm -hmm. me looking at you as an artist i go like when i'm trying to pick up an artist i look for someone who's constantly looking for that grind looking to push forward um and i yeah. think you have that like you have this constant essentially there's something you're working towards there's something you want more there's something you want to do yeah always um that pretty much is wrapping it up for our time today. I've had a blast. We're going to have you on again because right. there's so much more. We're going to be just it's talking only about. just begun. Can we plug in some of your social media? Where can we find you? Where can someone get the taste of this visual greatness we were talking about earlier to kind of internalize? Where can we find you? Yeah, I think that. You know, just just get to my Instagram and you can find everything else from there. And it's uh, at Just Bergen. J Spell it out for them. There we go. Yeah. J-U-S-T-B-E-R-G-E-N. Just Bergen. And you can see all my art and my shit, you know. Um, you can see all the hood hoodlumery that I get into. I love it. Thank you so much, guys. Tune in for our next episode. Stay safe. Keep it We're real. Keep it real. Yeah, keep it real, guys. Wear a mask. We're going to all get through this uh, lockdown soon. So One day at a time. And me and Michael about to drink one more shot of Jameson before we go. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning into the Art Matcher podcast. We had an interesting discussion, a great time, and we hope you did too. Please tune in for next week's episode and like, share, and follow. For more information about the app, you can check out our website at artmatcher.com or look us up on social. Stay safe and be artful.